Hey guys, it's Lily from Legit Nutrition Hawaii. Today's format is going to be a little bit different from what we're used to. It's going to be more of like a story time. So let me know in the comment section below how you like it. So this story time has been inspired by a recent video that was made by these YouTubers called Simon and Martina. And much like myself, they are passionate foodies and world travelers. And this recent video was them eating Akita beef in Japan. And the whole video really struck a chord with me because it reminded me pretty perfectly of my past and who I used to be. And if you want more information or more examples as to the content of Simon and Martina's video, or if you want to hear a really excellent rebuttal or reaction style video, please go check out the video that was made by that vegan couple on the same subject, as they've done a really good job. So, when I was 18, I moved to New Zealand and I decided to attend culinary school. And what I found there was an extremely passionate community of culinary artists who introduced me to an entirely new world that I never even realized existed. And I fell into that culinary culture hard. And I loved it. I would wake up early in the morning, I'd go to school all day, go straight from class to work, then work an 8 to 12 hour shift. Once that was over, I would go out and party with the whole crew from the restaurant until the wee hours of the morning, then get a couple of drunken hours of sleep and do it all over again. And all the while working at these really nice restaurants where I was cultivating a new obsession with the finest ingredients and learning how to turn those into food that was truly artistic and epic. And I was all in. I loved it. I absolutely loved the artistry. I loved the obsessive focus. I loved the long hours, and I loved what we called clear jacket nights, where you were sweating so much that your white jacket went clear. I loved the yelling, I loved the injuries, I loved the perceptive coordination that you need to work seamlessly with another chef. And I really learned to love that feeling of sitting down to a meal where every single component has been neurotically planned tested and refined to provide you with a purposeful, full body experience of food. I loved it. I wanted to belong to it. And to belong to it, I had to love the hedonistic pleasures of raw meat and aged cheeses and the unexpected. Guiltlessly overindulging in foods like foie gras and veal and lamb and raw fish that still twitched when you ate it was sexy. The hedonistic selfishness was like a badge of honor. It was essentially a requirement of this foodie mentality. And chefs, in case you've never had experience with them, are some crazy artistic badass motherfuckers who can make magic happen in some of the most horrendous working environments you can imagine. And they are one of the only populations I've ever met who has genuinely mastered not giving a fuck. They're focused. They're hard. They don't feel. And if they do have a feeling, it is smothered in butter and vodka and swallowed. And the foodie culture has been modeled after them because, well, you know, chefs created it. And have I mentioned? I loved it, until the crazy lifestyle eroded my health, but that was later. But specifically here, I want to talk about the foodie perception of ingredients. When I was studying and working to be a classically trained chef, I learned that my ingredients were of the utmost importance. They were everything, and taste and pleasure were above everything else. And in New Zealand, your ingredients are honestly epic! Virtually all of the meat is pasture-raised, and the animal products are incredibly fresh. You have a great seasonal variety of fruits and vegetables that taste better than any other fruits and vegetables I have ever tasted, ever. Ever. All of the meals that I cooked were centered around the protein, which is code for meat. The plant-based accompaniments to the protein are definitely treated as second-class citizens. And to be considered palatable, they're generally speaking smothered in butter or cheese and salt. And because I wanted to be the best chef that I could, and because I was a dedicated foodie, I wanted the best ingredients I could get. Whole paychecks would go to meals. I wanted Wagyu. I wanted A5 quality beef. I wanted fresh lamb and veal, and I wanted it butchered, aged, and prepared perfectly. Because the underlying culture is pleasure, and the assumption is that the pleasure comes from the meat. It comes from the cheese, the foie gras, the 
fat, the indulgence. And then in culinary school, I reached the point where all of the students had to complete the butchery module. They called it meat school. And I walked into that industrial carcass processing plant like a cocky bitch. And that was the first time I saw a whole cow. Minus the head, tail, blood, entrails, and skin. And it was hanging there in front of me on a hook that went right behind its Achilles tendon. And I remember that it looked just like a cow. And I was so struck by how much it looked like a dog and how it could easily even be compared to the anatomy of a human. And I remember the sound of the manual bone saw. And I remember the crackling and the fascia ripping and the huge chunks of flesh that were being taken off of this animal that just, you know, not a long time before that had been walking around a pasture. But I kept my face completely expressionless and I refused to let myself look away. And I remember how I pretended that it didn't faze me, that I didn't care. And most of all, I remember how I rationalized in my head over and over and over again. This is what happens. This has to happen. This happens every day. Don't be weak. Get over it. Harden up. So that's what I did. I hardened up and I left, having been given the instructions to study ungulate anatomy overnight, and I came back the next day. I grew up in America, in the suburbs. My family bought meat in plastic packages. There was no blood, there was no bone, there was no reality, right? And it was only during the rare road trip that I would even see cows. <laughs> so we moved to New Zealand and there are literally cows and sheep everywhere. Like, everywhere. And in the spring, the mama sheep have their babies and there are lambs everywhere. Everywhere. And they are so freaking adorable with their little lamby tails when they're running around playing with each other and I was just in awe of how cute they were. And then right before Easter, no more lambs. And again, it was rationalized. This is what happens. This has to happen. It happens every day. Get over it and stop being weak and harden up. Which brings us back to meat school, where the emptied, skinned, and decapitated body of a child was handed to me, and it looked just like a baby lamb, minus its adorable cotton ball wool. And I kept a straight face, because this is what we do. This happens every day, it has to happen, you have to get over it, don't be weak. And I did. I used a special type of knife that is specifically designed for cutting muscle from bone to dismember a baby so that its body parts could be sold. And I thought I was gonna throw up the whole time. And I remember the remnants of blood and the flesh getting stuck in my fingernails. And I remember how I couldn't get that smell out of my skin for days. When I was poking around the neck area, I found this massive blood clot. And I asked our teacher like, yo, what is this? It looks super gross. Um, what do I do with it? And he very casually said, Oh, that's just where they're electrocuted. You just have to cut it out from the meat because it tastes awful. It tastes like adrenaline. And I thought about this little baby. You know, it was, it was only a couple months old and it had been forcibly taken away from its mother. It had been herded into a little room with all of its playmates that it grew up with. And it watched as strange humans electrocuted and bled out its friends one at a time until it was your turn. And I remember I said, that's horrible. And he just rolled his eyes at me and said, that's life. They're just dumb sheep. You know, sheep have the capacity to remember and recognize hundreds of unique sheep faces. They know when members of their flock are missing or if they die, and they mourn that loss. Their herd is everything to them. And while they might seem stupid to us, they are smart in their own sheep way. Just like cows and pigs and chickens and dogs and dolphins are smart in their own unique ways too. So I hardened up and I finished my task at meat school and I left and I didn't change my behavior. I didn't change anything. I kept working at restaurants and I kept trying to relish that like hedonistic foodie lifestyle. Selfish pursuits number one and it's all about pleasure and taste. But my perception had changed. Every time I looked at the meat that I was cooking, even though I kept telling myself to harden up, I couldn't help but think about the animal from whom it was taken and how that animal had died in just in a terrified panic. And soon after meat school was finished, I was required to do an internship at a 
restaurant of my choice, and I chose one of the nicest restaurants in Wellington, Logan Brown. This place is legendary, and the chefs that work there have the ego and intensity to prove it. So it was almost Christmas, and they were working on getting their Christmas feast menu finalized. And they wanted to serve crayfish, which is essentially New Zealand lobster without the big claws. But they wanted to serve crayfish tail on a plate. And the problem is that when you boil a crayfish or a lobster, their tail curls up. Because first of all, they're trying to protect themselves when they're put into boiling water while they're still alive. And second of all, that's just what happens to protein when it's exposed to heat. It coagulates and flexes. So I stood there and I watched as two grown men tried to hold down a crayfish as they rammed a metal skewer up its tail while it was still alive. And I remember they were laughing because they were having such a hard time stopping it from flailing. And my entire body was just screaming, like, say something or stop this or get the fuck out. But I didn't want to lose face and get mercilessly made fun of for being the weak, stupid American girl who couldn't handle. But I knew right then that I didn't want to be a chef anymore. I mean, I wanted to be a high-end chef. I loved the work, I loved the intensity, I loved the focus, I loved the artistry of it. And it was my identity, but I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do the butchering, and I couldn't do the killing, and I couldn't do the reality of foie gras, and veal, and lamb, and I knew that that weakness was unacceptable in the culinary culture because I couldn't deny the fact anymore that glamorizing murder wasn't okay. And I had realized it a long time before that, but until that moment, I had never allowed myself to really feel the truth of the fact that suffering isn't worth taste. And now I watched this video of these two people who were just literally gushing over this sexualized, overly fattened piece of a cow's body whose entire lineage is known and whose uniqueness is celebrated and whose life was valued strictly for increased profits up until the moment that she was murdered and who did not willingly give her life. And they make fun of her. They mock her for her lack of choice in the matter. And I know, because I remember, that their sense of reality, their sense that this is wrong, is right there. Right there at the surface. But at the same time, we rationalize. This is normal, right? This is what we do, don't we? If I care, it's weakness, isn't it? You know, my pleasure is most important. I deserve this. Suffering? Killing, stealing, is not worth taste. You are not eating food. You are eating someone. And that someone was bred and raised specifically to be murdered. So a human can consume its body and fluids for pleasure. You know, admit it or not, but that is sick. It's fucked up and it is completely unnecessary. If you take the time to peruse my other videos or my Instagram, you will see that I am still very much a foodie. But I'm a foodie that now eats with my head, my taste buds, my heart, and my stomach. And I gotta say, I like it better. I've also learned how to be an actual good chef. Because if you can't cook an amazingly delicious, dynamic, flavor-rich meal using plant foods, you are a shitty, poorly rounded out chef, to be blunt. And if you're a foodie who's not capable of enjoying the flavors, textures, and subtleties of a plant-based meal, you're not a real foodie. You're a junkie, and you are trading everything. Your health, your morality, your potential for instant gratification and passing pleasures that are based in selfishness. And that's about all I have to say about that. I was gonna do it in the Forrest Gump voice, but... Alright guys, this was supposed to be a short video. Whoops! Again, please rate, subscribe, and if you have a minute, please share this video with Simon and Martina. So maybe they can start to make the connection and take the steps towards a delicious and fulfilling and food-focused diet that doesn't also require suffering. And do please leave comments and questions below. You know I love them. So until next time, make better choices for yourself 
and for who ends up on your plate and take really, really good care.